Amen. And he is certainly captivating when you let him be captivating. Amen. It's good to see you this morning. Had a great worship service already experienced at our other campus. Lord showed up. That's always nice when he does that. Amen. I know he's present all the time, but sometimes we don't realize his presence. And he made his presence. No, we had a great time and expecting the Lord to do the same here. Hope you got a little extra rest last night. Some still move their clock the wrong directions. They always have that. They were here early. <laughs> they never got here in time for the rest of the service, though, so we'll see if they show up. But anyway, it is good to see you this morning. And uh, just returned from vacation down in Mexico. We had a great time just uh, doing nothing. You ever have those vacations? Sometimes you get so busy on vacation, you're so tired, and you come back, you need a vacation. We slept and ate and went out in the water and slept and ate and went out in the water and slept and ate and went out in the water and slept and ate some more and slept and ate some more. So I'm a much bigger man for my vacation. <laughs> Grown in the Lord, as they say. The Lord, I mean, excuse me. But uh, we're in our series that we're continuing today on the, the mystery and the mission of the body of Christ, the glorious church of the Lord Jesus. And I hope that you've been paying close attention because I really believe if we don't get this down, we just miss what we're here for and we miss the whole uh, grand design of what God is up to. This is, these, to me, from Scripture, once we take the time to look, these are the obvious things. There's so many people running around and wanting to know what's the will of God about this and what's the will of God, but they're not willing to do what already is the obvious or the evident will of God. For you to be a Christian, that's the will of God. For you to be in love with Jesus, well, that's the will of God. To you be filled with the Spirit on a daily life and a daily walk, that's the will of God. For you to be a part of the glorious body of Christ, that's the will of God. For you to be an active part, that's the will of God. For you to find your place, your ministry, your mission in the world through the body of Christ, that's the will of God for our life. There's nothing greater than the church that goes on in the whole universe, by the way. In case you haven't known, we've talked about that several of the last weeks, just about how distinctive and unique the body of Christ is. You know, if you uh, go home today and you flip on the football game about every five minutes or so, the, every time there's a break or a time, they're going to have what's called a commercial. There's an advertisement. In fact, it's every few minutes on TV, there's an advertisement. You drive down the streets, the bulletin boards are there. There's advertisements. All kinds of marketing. And marketing really wants to uh, do one thing. It wants to reach into your heart and mind and convince you that whatever the product is, that it's unique. Or if it's not unique, then whoever the seller of the product is, that they're unique. I mean, we all have Dodge dealerships all over Houston, but oh, our Dodge dealership, that's a unique one because of customer service. And we want to set ourselves apart and distinguish ourselves, whatever the marketing ploy is. It all gets back down to that, that we're, we're special and we're distinct. Well, folks, there's nothing more distinct than the body of Christ. There's nothing more unique than the body of Christ. There's nothing more powerful than the body of Christ. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun, and really the church has been in the mind of God and in the heart of God. Paul the Apostle referred to it as the mystery that had been hidden from the ages, but has now been made known to us. So there's this great mystery that God's had and held back and now is revealing to us, the church, and that is the heartbeat of everything that what we have been looking at over the last several weeks. And we can say that, that there's only one entity in all the universe that is totally distinctive set apart from everyone else and set apart from everything else, and that's the body, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the, so we want to deal with the distinctive things about the church today. In fact, several of the church's important distinctives are found in certain passages that Paul wrote to, to Timothy and really even to Titus. He, Paul sent Titus to oversee the local churches on the island of Crete, which is why the books of 1 Timothy and Titus, these books were written to share with these men how the church functions, what the order, the construction, the ministry, the mission, what this whole mystery of the church is all about. And these books explain what the local church is and how the local church works. All right, I'm clicking it, but it's just clicking around. All right, go back one more and go to the bottom point. One, two, three. Let's see if it comes up. All right. But anyway, these books explain why the, uh, how the local church works, why it works. And so that's pretty much where we're spending a lot of our time. Go ahead and leave it there on 1 Timothy because you're not going to get there. <laughs> Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read a couple of verses from this, but this whole study looks at these verses 1 through 13. And this is 14 and 15 when it says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of truth. 
His purpose in writing this, basically in a nutshell here, is to tell Timothy and Titus, ultimately his letters are circulated, how people who belong to Christ and who are part of the body of Christ, how they ought to conduct themselves. And the word conduct themselves is that talks about our life style. How we conduct ourselves as the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. Here's how you ought to behave. Here's how you ought to act. Here's how you ought to, to, to live your life. Now, obviously, when Paul writes to Timothy, he's over in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, you know, when Paul went there, there was a riot. So those people conducted themselves in a riotous manner. They lived in immoralities and fornications. and all. There's that pagan backdrop as Paul's writing this letter to the church. He says, but you're the people of God. You conduct yourself differently. And we ought to know how to conduct ourselves. And it ought to be entirely different those folks at the temple of Diana or Artemis or whatever it might be, we conduct ourselves completely different. Our lives are different. Our, our whole church is distinctive and unique. So that's what I want to talk about is how we conduct ourselves. And in, in looking at that, I want to talk about the distinctives today. I'm going to look at four distinctives of the church and how that we are unique and what God says to us and how I really believe if we understand these distinctiveness and distinctives of the church, the uniqueness of it, then it will if we do understand it, obviously affect the way we conduct ourselves in the house of the living God. So let's take it up first of all. We have a distinctive motivation. A distinctive motivation. The church's first distinctive trait relates to our identity as members of the, of the household of God. Because God is our Father, He has invited us into His home. We are now part and have been adopted into His family. Since we are the family of God, God is our Holy Father, then certainly we ought to conduct ourselves differently than the rest of the world conducts itself. I mean, how much more... Uh, uh, unique can we be? We can't be any more unique because God is the absolute holy one, the unique one over all the universe. There's nobody like God. There's nothing like God. There never will be anything like God. Never. The Bible says God said of himself, there's none before me and there's none after me. I'm God. So if his, he is God our Father and he has changed us and he has brought us into his family, then certainly we ought to conduct ourselves as the children of the Most High God, the children of God's household. I don't know how it is at your house, but you know, when, when, when you move in, in part of my family, you're raised in my family, I'm the head of the house, all right? If you're going to live in my house, then you're going to conduct yourself according to the rules that I set up in my house. Can every father and parent say amen to that? I mean... Our lives will be different as the arms family. I, I always taught my children that they, there's an important part of being a part of the arms family. And it really didn't have anything to do with the fact that I was the pastor of the church, you know. Uh, because, you know, I've heard a lot of preachers put a lot of pressure on the, oh, you're the preacher's kid, you better straighten up and fly right, you know. If I hear about you, you know, because there's that verse in there that says, if you can't conduct your own household, how can you oversee the household of God? It's a lot of preachers under a lot of stress, all right? So I didn't want to do that in that regard, my children, but I did want them to realize that not only were they part of the arms household, but once they'd given their life to Jesus, they were part of a grander household. So even to this date, I still tell my children as they depart, or as I depart their place, remember whose child you are. Not in the context of you're the arms kid, all right? You're the pet, nope, they're God's kid. And I really believe that if they ever get that, if we ever get that, if people ever get that, then we will conduct ourselves differently. We've all told our kids, I remember whose kids you are, you know. And we want them to have a sense of identity within the family. You need to, as children, identify with, with your roots, with your parents, with your family. That's, that's, your, that's your blood, you know, that's, that's your family. But even greater than that is this royal family that we are part of, our heavenly Father, who says, you know, he's telling us how we ought to conduct ourselves in the household of God. I mean, it, it's amazing what kind of motivations people use to get people to behave right. I mean, there's parents with their children, remember whose child you are, you need to act right, conduct yourself right. It's always a difficult challenge to get them to do it, though. Amen. I mean, some wives spend their whole life trying to get their husband to act right. No amens, please. But we, we were looking for motivation. How do I get them to respond? Well, let me tell you, folks, if you're looking for a motivation for your proper behavior as a person, as an individual in the household of God, then that motivation is going to be found in understanding your identity as, as the children of God. You belong to Christ. He has redeemed us. He has adopted us. We are now in His family. So we have this unique, this distinctive motivation to behave properly, to act right. All right, That's what motivates us. And if it doesn't motivate you, then you need to realize who you are in Christ. Really get a grip. You belong to Christ. Paul the Apostle wrote later to the church at Rome. 
You are not your own. He wrote the same thing to the church at Corinth. You are the temple of the living God. You belong to God. Your body is not your own. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. All right. God is, is the one who is the master over our life. That's the motivating force. He's my daddy now, Father. He's my father. So I want to honor my father. I want to respect my father. I want to recognize my father and my identity and my relationship to him. I, our, our whole motivation should be affected by, by him. Unfortunately, we don't spend time with him. We don't honor him. We don't recognize him. What happens? Well, there's no motivation there. And what do we become motivated by? Other things around us? <laughs> motivated by the people we hang out with. How many times you tell your kids, what, who are you going out with? Who are you meeting? Who are you going to hang with? Who are your friends? <clears throat> and that's a proper thing as a parent because we want to know that. Why? Because who you hang out with affects you as an individual. My mama used to, you know, I quote mama a lot. Mama said, you lie down with dogs, you're going to get up with? Please. Y'all got it too, did you? <laughs> I came home scratching a lot tonight. She knew I was hanging with the dogs. <coughs> Excuse me. It's who you hang out with. It affects the way you behave. In fact, the things you watch is why I talk about this a lot. The things you read, the things you take into your mind, the things you listen to, those are all important factors. And the more you seek to relate to the world, the less you're going to relate to God. The more you seek to relate to Him, the more you're going to be motivated by Him. So who are you hanging with? What are you watching? What do you spend your time reading? What's your primary sources of entertainment? I mean, we need to take focus on these things because so often we find little motivation in our life. <coughs> so we need to seek for the things that motivate us to spiritual walk into a spiritual life. That's why Paul prayed for the Colossians and said that you may be filled, similar prayer for the Ephesians, by the way, that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding that you will walk, it's your lifestyle, in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects. I want God to fill your heart. I want God to be your number one source of relationship and fellowship. And out of that is a whole new life. So we have this distinctive motivation as the people of God to live a righteous life because God is righteous and God is holy. So if you want that kind of living and you want that kind of life, commit yourself to him and recognition of who you are in his family. The second thing is we have a distinctive master. I promise I didn't smoke a cigarette on the way here. <coughs> We just can't breathe this morning. Getting back to Houston air, so fresh. We have a distinctive master. That's the second distinction we want to talk about today. The household of God, which is the church of the living God, the scripture tells us. We're of this new household. And it, it, it is headed up by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible leaves no doubt as to who is in charge of the house. The church is headed over, led by the pastor? No. By the elders? No. It's by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the final authority in all matters. That's why we seek his will. That's why we seek to know his word. All right, so we, excuse me, go back to that. We have this distinctive uh, master, which is Christ. We need to get a grip on this. If Christ is over the household, then it certainly ought to change the way we relate to everything around us. You know, how many parents have ever walked into your kid's room and said, I want to get, I'll clean this room up. And they say it's something like this. It's my room. It's my room. I, I can do what I want to do in here. That's when you take your child by the little lobe of the ear, carefully, casually, so as not to offend them in any regard. Set them down at the table, pull out the paperwork on the house. The mortgage paper, a deed if it's finally paid for, whatever it might be. Pull it all out, take a look at it, and remind them that their name is not anywhere found on the deed. It's not on the mortgage papers, it's not on the title. It's not found anywhere. It says, Joseph Arms, Kathy Arms. I don't see anybody else listed here. The household, no matter what your name is, Amalgabar, I don't see any other names. Your name is... You get to use the room in my house. You get to stay here for a while. There'll be a while when you get to leave. <laughs> now, you can call it your home because we're your family. It's our family. But ultimately, I own the home. The yard around it, everything in it. All right? It's mine. So go clean my room up. <laughs> if you would like to continue to use it. Amen? Amen? But how often does the Lord need to take us by our little lobe, set us down at the table and say, listen, 
That body that you are in belongs to me. What are you putting in it? What are you doing with it? Where are you taking it? That mind belongs to me. That church you belong to, it belongs to me. And you need to know how to conduct yourself in the house of the living God. I'm the master. We have this distinctive master, and praise to God, he is a benevolent, loving master. He cares for us. He's concerned about us. He's there to redeem us, to save us, to serve us. But yet, even in all that, he is there as the Lord of glory. He's the Lord of the church. And we have this distinctive house that we're a part of now called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is God over all things. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord and all that's in it is the Lord and all who dwell in it are of of the Lord's. In fact, as we live in this thing called Believer's Fellowship, this local church and this assembly, God tells us we should learn how to conduct ourselves here. And he's not saying to take this verse and to say, okay, children, don't run in the hallway. That's proper behavior, perhaps. But what he's talking about is, encompasses much, much more. He's talking about how we live our lives in regard to him, to the world, to each other even. In fact, Paul went on later and explained to the church that we have this obligation to live and to conduct our relationships accordingly and properly. And how do we do that? How do I relate to you if you're older than me? I relate to you as a man, as father. How do I relate to you if you're younger than me or the same age as me, as my brother? If I relate to you as a, as a woman, as a mother, if she's older than you, you respect her as you would respect and honor your mother. If she's the same age or somewhere near, you respect and honor them like you do a sister. Young men treat their young sisters like sisters, all right? Amen. Young ladies, you treat the young men like they're brothers in Christ. We are the family of God. We are the people of God. So since we have this distinctive motivation that being part of this royal family and this distinctive master, then we obviously learn how to conduct ourselves properly in the household of God. The third thing is we have a distinctive mission. Now you'd expect a living body, which we are, with a distinctive motivation and this distinctive master to have a distinctive mission. And that's what we find out with the church. Paul pointed this mission out when he said, you are the church, the pillar, the support of truth. The pillar and the support of truth. And I think that in his mind, he's thinking about you know, Timothy, he's certainly going to relate to the fact of, of, of these pagan temples that were there, like Artemis and the Parthenon of Greece. And I mean, you can go up to Nashville and see a copy of the Parthenon that's there in one of the parks. And it, there's these massive columns, hundreds of columns around the temple of Artemis. And, and just these columns supported the whole temple. Well, God's telling Timothy through the apostle that, you know, the church is the pillar that supports the truth. We hold up the truth. That's our responsibility. You want to know what your distinctive mission in the world is? What Believer's Fellowship distinctive mission is? What your part, being a part of Believer's Fellowship, your distinctive mission is? Is to hold up the truth and to bear the truth. That's number one, and and is a sub-point of this, that we are to hold up the truth. I mean, I said earlier, Paul drew the religious background of Ephesus, you know, in in delivering to uh, uh, to, to Timothy and to Titus as they were in these areas to see these temples. I mean, in the Artemis temple, there were more than a hundred of the pillars that supported the temple. On that were all kinds of decorations and adornments that were there. (coughs) But there's only one source of truth. And that one source of truth in all the universe, Paul said in Ephesians 4, is only found in Jesus Christ. Only in Christ. (coughs) Here's the thing about it, and I believe the point here, is that Paul is telling us that God has entrusted you and I with the truth. It's our responsibility to hold up that truth. That in the world we live in and everything that's going on around us with all the, all the words, all the philosophy, all the religions, all the ideas, there's still only one truth. And how is God going to bear into the world that we live in? How is he going to bring that message of truth in? How is he going to make it known to the world around us? He's going to do it through the church. We are to hold up the truth. Now, truth is simply <coughs> a fixed standard by which reality is measured. It's a non-negotiable reality, all right? Thank you, sister. <laughs> it's not prescription formula, is it? <laughs> it's a non-negotiable standard. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing changes it. If it's true, it's true. I mean, the situation not change it. The economy's not going to change it. The uh, uh, environment, atmosphere, temperature, uh, your situation, uh, 
your, uh, your world that you particularly live in, it, no matter what, when truth is introduced, it's truth. It bears up under all things. It's, everything else is measured by that truth. And we are here as the church to hold up the truth that God has showed us. Remember, Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. free. We find freedom in Jesus Christ. Now, if I choose to reject the truth, all I am left with is a lie. Let me say it again. If I choose to reject the truth, all that I am left with is a lie. So I'm going to live by one of two things. I'm going to submit to the truth, believe the truth, receive the truth, follow the truth, and proclaim the truth, or I'm going to reject that, and I'm going to believe a lie, receive a lie, you know, uh, speak a lie, and hold a lie. Now, if truth leads to freedom, guess what lies lead to? Bondage, captivity. Truth is freedom. Lies are bondage. If you find yourself in bondage, it could well be that you've not lived the truth and proclaimed the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. It is interesting to know that when Jesus made that declaration, there were no other ands, ifs, or buts about it. He just is, all right? Lies lead to bondage, which explains why the unsaved world is in bondage to Satan, because he is a liar. The Bible says a liar from the beginning, and he's also called the father of lies. So I'm going to follow Christ, then, truth. I'm going to believe a lie and follow a lie, then who am I following? Satan. Now, we don't like to get it down to that kind of nitty-gritty because nobody wants to say, well, I'm following the devil. And we want to say, well, I'm not following Jesus. I'm just kind of doing my own thing. That's a lie. Well, I'm not following Jesus, but I... No, if you're not following Jesus, that's just it. You're living a lie. That's why Jesus said in 1 John, John wrote, as the Lord speaks to the church, he said, you know, uh, you, 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 know you need to live the truth. But if you don't live the truth and you walk in darkness, then you lie and you do not the truth. So truth is something that we hold up. It's something that we believe. It's something we express. It's the, it's, it's, it's the essence of everything that we are. Our life is lived according to truth. I make decisions based upon the truth. Is, is it what God wants or not what God wants? I, I, I make choices every day, and they should always be balanced within the context of and held up to the context of what is true. If it's not true, if it's not righteous, if it's not just, if it's not pure, I don't have anything to do with it. And neither do you. So we hold it the truth, but we also are to proclaim the truth. I mean, the church simply needs to convey the truth of God in its clarity and in its power. And this is a beautiful thing about the distinctive mission we have in upholding the truth. We've not only embraced the truth, all right, we're holding it up, we're holding up the world, but we're also going to proclaim it. It's not just something that I embrace, something I hold. It's something that has to be declared. We've been given this mission. Go make disciples. The way to make disciples is to proclaim the truth of God's Word. I lift up the truth. I am the truth. Jesus didn't say, I, I'm, I, I know the truth, did he? He didn't say, I have access to the truth. Jesus said, I am what? I'm the way, the truth. And Buddha can't say that, Muhammad can't say that, none of the ancient gods can say that, none of the mythological Greek gods can say that. Only one truth, and it is found in Christ Jesus, who is the living truth. He is the light, he's the way, he's the life. But most of all, if you really get down to who he is, I am truth. I mean, he is the personification, the embodiment of all that is true. If you want to know what's true in life, you go to Christ. So we proclaim him. We embrace him. We are, we are in this world to be the ones who let the rest of the world know what truth is. That's the distinctive life that we have. Nobody has this truth. All right? We are to proclaim the truth, but we're also to live the truth. It's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to stand up and speak the truth. The Bible says the things we speak ought to be the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. The things that are fitting for sound doctrine. Now, the goal of that instruction is that not only would we say we're going to live in this truth, we're going to embrace this truth, but I'm going to be a person who lets people know it, not only with words, but with my life. Because it really is fruitless to say something and not be something, because then people just look at us and say, well, you're just a hypocrite. You're not genuine. You're not real. And by the way, people are looking for truth. If you will be true, if you'll be genuine, that is going to be the thing that impacts their life. Not just some kind of little uh, flirtation thing you might have going on with Christianity, but a real hard embrace, love with Christ, love with God, living truth, speaking truth. That's what makes the difference. Verse 10 of that passage says, Show all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. In fact, the word adorn means to, 
to wear. You got this morning, you adorned yourself. The Bible says here, we're to live the truth. We're to adorn ourselves with truth. We're to wear truth like we would a garment so that people know that we are light and we are life and we are true and we are not about lies. We want to wear God's truth. And how do we do that? By putting it on display in our life by obeying God's word, by trusting what he says, by following his commandments. You know, the Bible doesn't say we need to, the Bible says we need to wear our doctrine, to live it out. It doesn't say wear it on our sleeves. I know a lot of people who do that, they kind of have this holier than thou attitude. There's no genuine humility in their life. But he's talking about a lifestyle, not of arrogance, not of, you know, not of pride, but something that walks with it with an attitude of humility so that people see the reality of God in your life. The gospel, the truth, what is it? It's ultimately the power that changes other people's lives. I've always been amazed from the day I first started preaching how that you could get up in any size group of people, small, large, medium, football field, and coffee house, wherever we were preaching Jesus from the early days of my ministry, one of the most astounding things to me was and still is, is that you can get up and you can live the truth and speak the truth, and there's such power in it that people's lives are changed. It's amazing to me. People get saved. People's lives are restored. Healing graces come into their heart and their mind and their life. God does miracles in people's lives. The power of God's Word is so incredible and so powerful. If we would just believe it and receive it and adorn it, live it out of our lives, speak it out with our people around us, literally be transformed. It's the power of God. When people get up and preach the Word of God and lives are changed, it's not because the individual speaking has great personality. You know me, I get all twisted and turned around, forget where I was, and I get my tongue tangled or tongue tangled or whatever it is, you know, and slobber and spit on myself, and make a mess. Hey, it's the power of God's Word that makes the difference, not charisma, not personality. Some of you say, well, if I just had a greater personality, I guess I could win more people to Christ. Wrong. It's not you. As long as you think it is, you haven't got much to offer. He is everything that someone else needs. You have Him to offer, and He'll make the difference in their life. He'll make the difference even when you begin to speak it to someone who's never been able to comprehend it before. The simplicity of your devoted life and the simplicity of the truth will transform their understanding. And God will speak to them in the core of their being and do a supernatural work within them. That's the power of God. Paul the Apostle said it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. This, that is a distinctive mission and a distinctive message that we have. This leads us to the last point about this distinctive message. It says, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness in this passage. By common confession, again, I think Paul's making reference here. Timothy knew especially where he was about the worship of Artemis because, you know, Artemis' followers in Ephesus used to chant as they'd gather together, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And everyone around would hear that chant and hear those people chanting those things. Well, the problem is Artemis is not so great. He's a lie. He doesn't exist. But Jesus is truth. He does exist. He came and manifested himself in the flesh and made a way for every one of us to know him personally. And we ought to be chanting, Great is the Lord Jesus Christ of Believer's Fellowship. Great is the Lord Jesus Christ of the Word of God. Great is the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. We ought to have a common confession. This great is the mystery of godliness. And what is this mystery we've talked about ultimately? He's talking about the church. The church has been called out to proclaim the Word of God and the, and the work of God and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The mystery that we hold up and proclaim. The mystery of godliness. That's Jesus at work in bringing people into his family. It's a great mystery to explain, but yet it's not a mystery that's not unexplainable, all right? The mystery of godliness, what Paul is summarizing our message as, is a message which can be understood. Remember, a mystery is not a puzzle or dilemma that no one can figure out, at least in Scripture. But it's truth that has been hidden before that time, but now revealed. Paul said the mystery of the church is now revealed. The resurrection of Jesus, God began to make his mystery known about the church. The demons saw it. In fact, the Bible says if they had understood this mystery that had been hidden, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. They knew all this was going to come about, that this was the plan of God. He didn't understand it. Satan did not. But out of the resurrection and out of the risen Lord came this body of believers whom he empires and unites and fills to bring forth his message to a world that needs a message. And that is us. 
And we have this mystery of godliness to proclaim. And again, it's something that is clear now. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most Bible teachers believe that the remainders of the verses here in, 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 uh, in, the, in the passage that we're reading from today, they believe it was part of a, the lines of a, of a hymn that the early church used to sing. It's, and it's, this hymn was all about the truth and, and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 16 that we, we read next is, is a verse that was used to, to be sung in the early church as the, the saints of God were together and early hymns were being established and worship songs were being written. This was one of the early ones, they said, taken from this verse. And it started like this, that he, you know, he is the one, this great Savior that we proclaim, he was revealed in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on the world, and taken up in glory. So if any of you songwriters were looking for some material, here's a great hymn that you can put together. But the church's message, ultimately, as you study this verse, is really the message of the church is Jesus Christ. He's the truth. The message we preach is Jesus Christ. From beginning to end, it is all Jesus Christ. Everything else we teach, everything else we do, grows out of the central focus that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. And all that we do, whether it's fellowship, whether it's worship, whether it's preaching, whether it's teaching, whether it's just joining together in a cell group, in a study group, we're out, what it's all about, in a nutshell, it's all about Jesus. Great is the mystery of godliness, and it all is uncovered and all made real as we understand the Lord Jesus Christ. We preach, as the apostle says, Christ Jesus and him crucified. That's our message. We have this great message and this great mystery to explain to people, but we also have this great Savior to proclaim. And what greater Savior than the Lord Jesus Christ? That's where that verse 16 comes in from 1 Timothy chapter 3. That's when he starts explaining. And it breaks down like this. The first line of the hymn was this. Jesus was revealed in the flesh. Now that's important that people understand that. That God made himself known in human form through his son Jesus Christ. He became visible in the flesh, born of a virgin, was, was lived without sin. Here he is. He's the son of God. He was not naturally conceived. He was supernaturally conceived. And he lived a supernatural life on the earth. That's the first line of the song we sing. The second line of the hymn is that he was vindicated in the spirit. Everything Jesus did and every claim he made was vindicated, was proven true by the Holy Spirit's power at work in his life. The first way was he lived a sinless life. Couldn't do that without the power of the Holy Spirit. Couldn't do that without being God. There's vindication of the fact that he lived without sin. You know, even Pilate said, I find no sin in him. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15, he was without sin. Second thing is, the way he's vindicated, is that Christ showed himself to be supernatural by the miracles that he performed. Remember Nicodemus' confession in John was that, you know, no one could do these things unless God was with him, unless it was God behind him, unless it was God didn't work with him. Jesus said in John 14, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Everything I've done, every miracle, from the raising of the dead to making the blind see to the lame walking, everything, the feeding of all these multitudes, has been to vindicate, to show, to prove to you that I am the Messiah, the promised one of God. The third greatest vindication in his life, you know what it was? It was the resurrection. God raised him up from the dead. And he was seen by more than 500 witnesses. He walked on the earth for 40-something days, and he was here, and he showed himself to hundreds of people. The resurrection, that's the receipt of salvation that has been purchased by the blood of Jesus for you on the cross. His resurrection vindicates the fact that he is the living, true, one of God, son of God, Messiah and Christ of God. Our hope and our salvation. The third line of the hymn says he was seen by angels. I mean, angels were a very active part of the life of Jesus. To Mary, to Joseph, they proclaimed the birth, the announcement to them. Even at his birth, to the shepherds, there was angels who proclaimed. There was an angelic choir that broke out in song at the birth of Jesus and pointed the people to the way. It is, it, 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 the, in the garden, when he's praying, there were angels present. The resurrection, there were angels present, seen by angels. Not just humans, but also seen in the Spirit. In other words... Jesus is endorsed by all of heaven throughout his whole life. The demons, the angels, those who followed Satan in rebellion as well, they knew who he was. They stood up and vindicated him by their own confession, Thou art the Christ, 
The Bible says in James that demons believe, but they shudder. The fourth line of the stanza is this. It kind of captures the essence of the distinct message, that he was proclaimed among the nations. And that's another way of stating the great commission that Jesus himself gave us. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. I mean, the beauty of this, if, if you just look at the logic of it all, is that Jesus is risen. He's here to bring life, salvation, and hope. And now he sent us out as a declaration. And from the early days of the church, from the moment that they are dispersed from Jerusalem, the Bible says in the four corners of the earth, they took the message of the gospel. And guess what? That message is still going out today. We're still proclaiming him among the nations. The fifth line of the hymn was, says he was believed on in the world. By the way, that, that's what we've been saying, that when the church presents the message of Christ and we preach in the power of the Holy Spirit, people respond. People's lives are changed. When people believe, they are saved. When people believe, their lives are transformed. When people believe, they're brought into the family of God. When people believe, their destiny is sealed for all eternity. So what a great line to sing is that he is believed on in the world. People believe the truth. They believe the message and their lives will change. The sixth line of the hymn was a statement of faith by saying that Jesus Christ was taken up in glory. That's his ascension. That's when he went up in the sight of the disciples and all who were gathered around and was lifted back into heaven, as it talks about in Acts chapter 1. That he was seen by all those. Remember that the angels were there as well. And they said to the disciples, Why, you men of Galilee, stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, not a spirit, not a soul, but a body. This same Jesus who has ascended, he's also going to come again in like manner. That he was taken up into glory, he's going to come down from glory. But right now we know that he's been taken up and taken into glory and he sits at the right hand of God the Father and we believe that he's coming back again. I mean, Jesus again, to be repetitious intentionally, Jesus is the message, the distinct, unique message of the church. And when you talk about Jesus, you've got something to talk about. There's nobody like Jesus. It's not like talking about Muhammad. It's not like talking about Buddha. It's not like talking about Confucius. You're talking about the Savior, the Son of God. There's nobody like him in all the universe. That's our message. There was an old church in England had a sign out in it. It said, we preach Christ crucified. Great message. But in time, ivy began to grow up over parts of the sign, and it covered part of the sign up to where the sign read only that we preach Christ. The ivy continued to grow, and before long, the sign just said, we preach. But then even the word preach was blocked out, and all that was left was the word we. We. It's pretty much the message of the church today, isn't it? What you got from me? How can you bless me? How can I prosper? How can my life be the best? How can I have more? What, can, what you got in it for me? Just what's in it for us? It makes no sense if the message is just us. We've got a lot of things that we can rejoice over the fact that God has done for us. We can praise the Lord over that. But that's not our message, is it? Our message is Christ Jesus. Our message is the Lord. Why? Because He is the one who transforms the hearts and the minds of anyone who will take the time to consider what He said and respond in faith and humility to what He said and believe, and their life is changed. I will say it again. There's nothing like church. I mean, you ought to wake up on Sunday mornings just, you know, so excited you can barely stand yourself. I'm going to church today. But even on Monday when you wake up, you ought to be still excited saying, I am church today. I'm church. I am God's way of taking church to my job site. Boy, are they going to be surprised. I'm God's way of getting into school today. All right, we're going to blow their minds, aren't we? I'm God's, I am God's avenue to uphold the truth to present the truth, to live the truth, to speak the truth. I have a unique master, I have a unique motivation, I have a unique message, and I actually have a unique Lord, who is the Lord of glory. So we, we miss the point if we just think we're going through, eh, it's time to get to church, do my little thing, sit in church, listen to songs, listen to sermon, I'll go home. And pat myself on the back, because I was a spiritual person. Jesus is the distinct and unique message of this church, His church. And it ought to be the distinct message of our life because we are part, an integral, unique part that God has put us and placed us into this body. 
But the Bible has a lot to say about local assemblies and fellowship. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're here, maybe you're looking for a church home today. Maybe you kind of just have the attitude that church is something I can do on Sunday and I can get my little inspirational speech this week to get me through the week. You've missed the whole meaning of the mystery of godliness. Half of the New Testament is clearly dedicated to the fact of what we ought to be, how we carry that message, how we make disciples, who we are, how God's gifted us, what we're responsible to, what we're responsible for, what our place is, how important we are to what God's doing in the world today, how we, how we can be effective in our life to making a difference in the world around us, that we are salt and we are light. All in all through Scripture, you see this part. You have a place. Your place is in the body of Christ. And listen, the Bible says church only a few times when it's talking about the universal church of all believers. The majority of every reference made in the Bible to church is dealing with local fellowships, local assemblies such as ours. That God has placed us here for such a time as this to be the church. Let's be the church. Let's be what God's called us to be. Now, if you don't know Christ, you can join a church, but you've missed the mark. You have to join Jesus first. You give your heart and your life to Christ. Receive Him as your Lord and your Savior. Let Him transform you and make you a new person. When you do that, the moment He does it, He puts you in His body. Then you find that place of ministry where you can serve the Lord and where you can be ministered to and where you can carry out a ministry where God can use you and you can make a difference in people's lives. The Bible tells us we need to be part of an assembly of believers. A church is holding up the truth and that's preaching Jesus Christ. There's a lot of churches that don't, can't proclaim we preach Christ and Him crucified. It's just we. That's the message. We don't want to be that kind of church. We don't want to be that kind of people. It's just about us. It's about Him. And we want Him to be glorified. I encourage you that if you're not a member of a church, active member of a body of believers that love Jesus, then you get involved today. You start today. You come be a part of this church if God's leading you. If you... If you've asked the Lord, and He's given you peace about being a part of this fellowship. I tell people not to join until God spoke to their heart. But if He's spoken to your heart, then don't hesitate. You can come today and say, listen, I'm a child of God. I believe that Jesus is the Lord, and I want to serve the Lord here and be a part of what God's doing here. But come on, be a part of it, and do what God wants you to do. Uh, you know, it's that time of year people are getting settled in. They've made moves. They've moved to new subdivisions, new houses, new homes, and new towns. They moved their furniture. They moved everything they own, but they never moved their church membership. Get where God wants you to be. Serve the Lord. Get involved in what he's got for you. Get, get to the place that God is doing those supernatural things in your life and through your life. But he does it in the church. So I don't understand. Neither do I. It's just the way he chose to do it. Amen. You know, we love to claim scripture, don't we? That one scripture is God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we think or ask. Y'all you know that scripture? Amen. Haven't you ever claimed that scripture? I know God's going to do this. But you know what the rest of that verse says? Remember we're always saying context, context, context. The rest of that verse says, God is able to exceedingly abundantly above all we think or ask through the church throughout all ages. God's working in the world today, not through lone rangers, but through the church. Find your spot. Find your place. Fill up and fire up. Amen? If you don't know Christ, come to Christ today. If you're a believer, and somehow you just haven't got down the fact that it's his house and you hadn't been conducting yourself properly according to His standards and His will, and you need to find a place in this altar today. You say, Lord God, I ask you to cleanse my heart and forgive me. I haven't been submissive to you. I haven't sought your will. I put my way above your way. I want you to forgive me. I want to confess my sin of disobedience to you. Fill me and cleanse me today in Jesus' name. And let God start a revival in your heart. Would you stand with your heads bowed as we go to the Lord? Father, you know every one of our hearts and lives.